Please open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter uh, 18. Well, ultimately be in chapter 20, but please open to, to chapter 18. You know, I mentioned last week, please read ahead. And when I say that, I know it's, I say that a lot, please read ahead. But please read ahead. Because, you know, we're not going verse by verse through this. We're not even going chapter by chapter in some cases. Like this morning, I asked you to read three chapters. We'll really focus on a small place. And the same thing next week. Read chapters 21 through 24 this week. And make it a part of your devotional time. And let the Lord speak to you as he, as he prepares us for what he, you know, he wants to, to say to us next week. But this morning, uh, as, we, as we walk through this, you know, I... <laughs> I, I, I just have to say this. Have you ever thought, I mean, you, you think of what Chris said about um, the way God used music and musicals and, you know, regardless of what the message is, you know, how our brains retain those kind of things. Imagine what God wants to do in us. You know, we even, you know, get words stuck in our vocabulary, like, awesome. Uh, where's RB? I won't point out. But, um, <laughs> You know, I, I love that word. You know, we know that God is awesome. But when you talk about hoagies and cheeseburgers and, and things like that, and they're awesome, right? God is awesome. And, 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 you know, one of the things that R.B. mentioned was, you know, the need that we have in all kinds of areas in this ministry. But in children's ministry, if we were to ask the music industry right now, would you take our children and... and adjust their minds for us, they would gladly take them. If we asked Hollywood, would you take our children and, 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 and you know, really influence their lives, they gladly will take them, they already have. Uh, would you, if we asked the porn industry, would you do that? They would gladly do that. As Christians, will we step up and, and will we become a part of, of helping to shape young lives? And well, we should. That's what God has called us to. And not just young, shaping young lives, but, but encouraging one another. And so uh, I just needed to say that before we go any further. We, we looked last week as we came out of chapter 17, the, the, our study prior to that, where God uses this young shepherd boy to go up against this giant, this, this monster, Goliath, when thousands of other soldiers refused to do it out of fear. David was willing to do it. And as a result of that then, he's brought into the court of King Saul. He's already been used um, since chapter 16 or for a few years up to that point. He's been used to, to play his harp or play the guitar for the king because the spirit of God was on David, but the spirit of God had left King Saul. And this evil spirit was tormenting him. And, and, and so God had been using David in this way. And now David had gone up against this giant. Um, Saul brings him in, gets information from him as to who his father is, etc. And, and he brings them into court. And, and as Jonathan, King Saul's son, is listening to all of this, the scripture tells us that Jonathan's soul was knit with the soul of David. It's a very interesting thing that we looked at last week. Because Jonathan, of all people, if anybody had, you would expect to be jealous, if, any, if you would expect anybody to, to have hatred or anger or envy, it would have been Jonathan. And yet he's the opposite of that. As he sees what God is doing in David's life, and here he is, though Jonathan is crown prince, He's next in line to, uh, to, to take the crown after his father dies. And yet he can tell, no one's told him, but he can tell that David is the one. David is the one who has the spirit of God upon him. He can see it. And, 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 and so his soul then is knit with the soul of David. As we, as we walk through chapters 18 and, and 19 and 20, we see that as as 
the, the men return back to their homes, the women are coming out. And it was, it was traditional in, in ancient times where especially the younger women would, um, would come out playing and, you know, music and singing and, and beating their tambourines and singing. And in this case, they're singing that, you know, Saul has slain his thousands and, and David his tens of thousands. And everybody is exuberant because of the victory that, that, that they have over the Philistines because of what this teenager has done he was willing to do when no one else was willing to step up to the plate and and Saul is really I guess ticked is the nicest way I can say it he's really ticked he's he's you talk about jealousy and envy hatred anger to the point where he wants to murder David he says you know Look, listen to what they're singing. Listen to the things that they're saying. What more can he have but the kingdom? At that point, Saul is beginning to understand, here's the next king standing in front of me. This is the guy. No one else has told him. He puts it together as, as he understands that. Because he'd been told, if you remember, by Samuel, many years prior to that, that God is taking the kingdom away from you, Saul, and it will give it to a better man, to give it to a man after God's own heart. And he's starting to now put the pieces together. And while his son's response is to, is to have his soul knit together with that of David, Saul's the exact opposite. What he wants to do is to kill him. And as you start to walk through these chapters, we see how a number of times he tries to pin David to the wall while David's just strumming his well, I say guitar, but you know what I mean, harp, you know, he, he takes his, his he, he fears David and because of, because of how evil Saul is and the spirit of God on David, he fears him and he hates him and he picks up his spear and he throws it across the room and he tries to pin him to the wall. Twice, David ducks. I, I don't know why twice. I mean, because I, I, I gather David is a much smarter guy than I am. But I'd have been out of there by the first time. I have no idea why, why twice. But in any event, twice he does that. And um, King, King Saul tries to marry him to, to his daughter Merav. Because um, that was part of the deal. You know, the, the one who kills this giant will get uh, the king's daughter, will be married into the family. And David said, you know, do you think it's a small thing that, that I would be son-in-law to the king? So Merav is married off to, to somebody else. And then we're told in chapter 18 that, that David is now sent and put as a captain over, over a thousand men. And we read that as a promotion, just, just a thing to think about. Consider the fact that he'd already been involved as um, one of Saul's armor bearers. In a sense, he was part, part of the personal bodyguard. So in one regard, that's actually a demotion because Saul's intention was to put him out into the field in, in battle where he'd be killed. He can get, just get rid of this threat. Okay? And, and so then he, uh, Saul says, you know, here's my daughter, Michael. You can marry her. And uh, again, David is like, you know, I, I can't afford a dowry. You know, I can't afford to pay the bride price. Uh, you know, how can I do that? And, and David is told by Saul, you know, all the king requires is that, you know, you go slay the Philistines and bring back a thousand Philistine foreskins uh, or hundred. And... Um, Either way, I know where your mind's going, and, and no, I can't answer the question, you know, <laughs> okay, but he brings back 200, just to show that, he, you know, that's the quality of character that's in this man, and he does marry Michael, and, and, but Saul is after him, and he's announced to Jonathan and to all the other men that he wants him dead, and, and Jonathan seeks to, to talk his dad out of it, and then Saul changes again, and he says, oh, no, you know. Far be it from me. I wouldn't do that. As the Lord lives, I, I wouldn't kill him. It's not going to happen. Uh, and, and, and Saul's moving back and forth. He, he's just a crazy king, and, but he's wicked. And, and David is unsure of himself, and yet at the same time, as far as the people are concerned, as far as the other soldiers are concerned, it says that he came in and out and everybody, you know, admired him. In other words, he was a regular guy. His, even though he had this esteem that, you know, many people, would, their head would have exploded because of, be, because of the, uh, the, the renown that they had. David wasn't like that. But then Saul turns on him again and he sends his men to, to go and to get David out of his house one night. And... Saul's daughter, Michael. It's interesting, you know, when, when he married David off or to his daughter, uh, Michael, he said, I, I, I'll give 
him Michael, that she may be a snare to him. Gives you an idea what kind of girl she was, I guess. But, um, and, and she says to David, look, my father's going to kill you. You've got to run. You've got to get out of here. And we read in chapter 19 that she takes an idol. Brings up a lot of questions. Why was there an idol in that house? But anyhow, she takes this, this object and puts it into David's bed. And, and the scripture says, put goat skin or goat hair over it. Um, and, and then when the men came to, to, you know, to, to grab David and to, uh, and to kill him, she said, oh, don't go ahead. David's sick. He's, you know, he's in there. He's got that stinky goat disease, I guess. Yeah, I don't know what, you know, she said. And uh, they were like, ooh, goat disease. I don't know what that is. So they left, you know, and they went back and they told Saul. And Saul said, well, <laughs> bring him to me. Just pick up the bed and bring him to me. I'll kill him myself. And as they go and they, 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 they pick him up, they bring, they realize that this, it's a ruse. And so, you know, Saul says to Michael, why, why did you do this? And she said, well, he threatened me. Well, she, he didn't threaten her. And Saul had raised someone with the same kind of character that, that he had, a liar, a cheat, a deceiver. And um, so that's the basic story. And we finally get to this point in the beginning of chapter 20 where David has met up now with, with Jonathan. And, and as he's speaking with Jonathan and he's explaining to Jonathan what, what has happened and that surely, you know, your father is out to kill me. And Jonathan is convinced, no, that can't be the case at this point. And the rest of the chapter tells us how Jonathan goes back to his, to his father and they set up this plan to see whether or not that's true. But this is one verse that I want us to look at in the beginning of chapter 20. Verse 3, David then took an oath again. They, they, they cut a covenant again. They confirmed the covenant they had between them as friends, deep, intimate friends. And he took an oath again and he said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul, Jonathan, as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. That's what I want us to look at. There is but a step, he says, between me and death. What's he saying? He's saying, I, I, no matter which way I turn, I'm not certain of what's going to happen. I, you know, that's how close I am to death because the entire power of, of the king and the, and the army of the Israelites ultimately could be against him. He doesn't know who he can trust. He could trust Jonathan, but he doesn't know who he can trust. He says there is but a step between me and death. How old is he at this point? Maybe he's 20 years old. And, 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 and this is going to begin a 10-year process from this point forward, really from chapter 20 through chapter 31. These 11 or 12 chapters will represent 10 years of his life until Saul dies, where David is on the run. Where, where God is protecting him and it's just a thin veil. He can't tell sometimes what's happening. And, and, he, and he's being stripped down and, and, and all the things that he trusts in are being stripped away from him. You know, it's, it's one thing to sit here and to talk about those things. Some of, those in, uh, so, some of us in this room have experienced some of that before where you feel like everything's being stripped away. The things that, that you placed your confidence in at one point, stripped away from you. The things that, that you thought were important, stripped away. The things that, that you depended on, stripped away. Whether in relationship or money or a job or a position or, you know, there's a, there's a long list of things. Stripped away. And in many ways, what God is doing is he's, he's stripping away what you might call the Saul in David. That, that part of, of David that is in any man or woman, that, that old nature, now his old nature is not taken away, he still has it, but to take away the, the, the suddenness with which he could become violent and, and, and become like Saul, God is, part of what he's doing is stripping that out of David. Yes, David is not a perfect man, he's, and it's not that he doesn't do um, some really strange and really wrong things later on, but God is making a godly man out of David by using this kind of, I guess I'd say heat, 
this kind of abrasion in his life. In, in Proverbs 27, I forget the verse right now, but basically it says, you know, the furnace, uh, God's furnace reveals the kind of person that we really are. Now, there's truth in that. You know, as we go through the tough times in our life, who we really are comes out. You know, you, you look sometimes in your sink and, and, and you see maybe a, a wet sponge sitting in the bottom of your sink. What's it, what's it wet with? Is it wet with apple juice? Is it wet with, you know, just uh, the schmutz that you, that you cleaned off the counter? Is it, is it is full of fresh water? You only find out by squeezing it. And it's only the squeezing that reveals what's really in that, that sponge. It's only the squeezing that goes on in life or the flame that we go through sometimes in life that reveals who we are and, and in the process burns away the dross for the believer. You know, burns away all that other stuff so that we look to the Lord. There is but a step, he says, between me and death. Hezekiah was, you know, many centuries later, Hezekiah will be dying and, and the Lord says to Isaiah, the prophet, to tell Hezekiah, put your house in order for you're about to die. Look, I don't want to concentrate on death this morning, even though that sounds like it in that, in that phrase. There is but a step. There's but a moment, there's but, there's but an hour, there's but a, a day, a week, a year, a whatever you want to call it, between me and death. But I don't want to concentrate on death. I believe it's important that we concentrate on life, that we concentrate on the fact that it's how we live in that step. That step for each one of us, it, it could be of all kinds of lengths. It's what we do with that step. And so often what we do with that step is so wrong. So often what we do with that step is so old nature. So often what we do with that step is so fleshly. It's so earthly. And, and look, I get it, okay? We're, we all have the same type of nature. And when we're born again, we still retain that old nature. But we have a new one now in Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God lives in us. We're born again by the Spirit of God. The blood of Jesus Christ has paid the price for our sins, but we're born again by the Spirit of God and His Spirit lives in us. Even King David didn't experience that. The Spirit of God was upon him, but he wasn't a born-again man. We wouldn't use that terminology because that's the old covenant. We're, we're under the new covenant. So we actually have a great advantage over David. Now the question is, what is that step in our lives and, and how do we live in that life. And I believe you can kind of look at this in many ways, I realize, but twofold, I would say. First of all, that we do finish strong. And secondly, for lack of a better word, this is kind of just the way my mind thinks, but that we would yield a good return on God's investment in us, in what he has done for us. When we think of the fact that the, you know, the, the value of the blood of Jesus Christ is beyond measure. Therefore, if we've been purchased, if our lives have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, then we are of immeasurable value. And, and one day we will stand before him as Christians. Only Christians can say this. Only Christians can look forward to this someday. And that is one day to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not to give an account for our sins, because they're paid for by what Jesus did for us, but to give an account for the way that we lived as believers and to receive reward for the things we did for him. The things that he put on our heart to do, the things that he empowered us to do, he will then reward us for that. I mean, it's an amazing thing, and, and we don't have time to concentrate on that, but one day that will be the case for us. And so I, what I'd like to do actually is spend a little time looking at a passage that's in the New Testament, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, this is why I say it's important to bring our Bibles when we, when we come to, to church. And, and so we don't just hear, but we actually read what it says there. So here's the Apostle Paul saying this. In chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, speaking of what we have now and you know, being born again and, and the glory of God actually living in us by his spirit, he says, beginning here in, in um, verse 7, he says, 
But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, these bodies, okay? And your, your Bible may say in jars of clay, okay? But we have the, this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body or our bodies. We, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, in jars of clay. And, you know, we, we talk about it a lot, but really it's a very serious thing. We, these vessels, these vessels are 70% water. They're 70% water, and the other 30% is made up of the same 17 elements that you'll find in your front lawn, in your garden. And, and, and that's why we say, well, we're basically mud. And, you know, it's, it sounds nicer to say clay because we say, you know, he's the potter and we're the clay. But clay, mud, no matter how you want to look at it, that's, that's who we are. That's what we are. We're mud. And, 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 we, and we look at our mud and we, and we want to shape our mud and we do all kinds of things with our mud or with our clay. Because we look so much at the things that are seen. We look so much at the things that are in this life. And those are the things that, that so often matter to us. And I, I realize that I'm talking to, to believers for the most part when I say this. But as believers, we do this. And, and, and it's not that these vessels are unimportant. Of course they're important. This, uh, the, these vessels are, are the vessel in which our souls and our spirit and, and, and God's spirit indwell these vessels. But, but we look at the, the, the jars of clay so much. We look at the mud so much. And, and it's how we dress our mud or how we shape our mud, uh, what we do with our mud. We look at other people's mud. We, you know, we, we, we want to know how fast the mud could run. We want to know how, how much the mud can lift. We want to know, you know, you know I, there's all kinds of things you could talk about about what we do as far as how we value the mud of our lives. And yet we're so much more than our mud. And we're, we're, we, we have this tendency to look at it. But, but, and I know some people say, well, yeah, but, but I'm anointed. Doesn't the scripture say I'm anointed? Yeah, yeah. So, so you're a greasy ball of mud. But, but the, the bottom line is that's what we are. You know, we're, we're, we're mud. And, and or, or, for clay, that's fine. But Paul's saying we have this glory. We have this, this, this incredible glory of God living inside these vessels. And, you know, people, it's the old joke, you know, that, 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 that we're cracked pots. Yeah, God calls you a crack pot. Um, we're all crack pots. I mean, some are, seem to be a little bit more of a crack pot than others. And, and some of us may have more cracks in us than others. But the point is that God desires to do it that way. So that, it, it, he'll say in 1 Corinthians, that God loves to use the weak things of the world to confound the strong, and he, and he uses the, the, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And that's who we are. We're the weak and the foolish. Now, that sounds like an insult, but, but God's saying, but I like to do it that way so that people understand that it's not you, John, who's doing anything that's of any value. Anything that's of any value that God values is only what he does through my life. Anything that God values that we'll receive reward for one day is only what he does through your life or through my life. Now, that doesn't apply to someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Because for someone who refuses Jesus Christ, we're going to be held, those people will be held accountable one day when the books are opened. And Everything they've done in their lives, they'll be held accountable for, and they'll pay the price for that themselves. For the Christian, we're saying, praise the Lord, he took my, he took my penalty. He took my punishment. Everything I deserved, he took it upon himself so that I've been set free. That's his mercy. By grace, I'm called a son of God or, or you know, we're sons and daughters of, of, of the great king. 
He says, if you go down to verse 16 there, he says, therefore we don't lose heart, even though our outward man, that's what we see on the outside, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. As believers, that inward man, that inward person, our soul, now with our spirit alive in Christ, is being renewed day by day. He says, he uses a very interesting phrase. He says, for our light affliction, meaning the hard stuff of our lives, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, or a step, there is but a step between me and death. There's but a moment between me and death. Our light affliction, which is for, but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Our light affliction. You know, it's, it's quite interesting to me that Paul is writing this after he's already experienced five, five whippings. Three times it says that he was beaten with rods. He's been stoned. He was shipwrecked four times. He was left in the ocean to drown. He, he, he's faced perils, he says. He's been imprisoned. He's starved. And, and he says, these are light afflictions. You think, you're nuts. Right, come on, let's be honest. We, we, that's where our mind goes. But, but if we would think of what Paul has been up against and now consider the afflictions of our lives, consider the abrasion that we're up against in our life, consider the flame that we go through in our life. Paul is saying these are light afflictions. If we compare ourselves to, to what he's been through, and you know, we should only go so far with that, but you know, and recognize Paul's not a masochist. He doesn't, he's not looking for, uh, to, to be beaten. That's not what he's looking for. He's saying it happened so that God would be working out in him a much greater weight of glory. There's something of much greater value that's ahead. You know, I, I mean, and, and you know, when we think of these earthen vessels and we think of the things that, that we go through, and I realize that there are people in this room, young 12, 13, 15, 20 years old. And you hear some guy prattle on about some of this stuff and you say, you know, what, what kind of affliction? You know, I, I remember looking at my dad and, and seeing this sort of a, you know, this curve in, in his back when, when he would walk or even when my, my mom was like in her early 60s. I remember her like getting up and saying, oh, my aching swanee. I never knew what a swanee was. You know, I, I think swanee river, what does that have to do with how you feel? You know, that's, I, I still don't know. I should have Googled it. But, and, uh, but, but I don't know what the swanee is, but I, I, I feel it. You know, I mean, I, I'm getting to a point where I'm starting to feel that ache and swanee thing. And, and, and it's just what happens to our mud. It, you know, we, the system breaks down, but the soul is eternal. And, and, and God is doing a, a powerful thing in us. He says that, you know, all of this is wasting away. It is. This is wasting away. And, and, you know, we use the phrase a lot of times. We say, you know, it's all going to burn. And that's true. But we think that's way, way, way out in the future. And that's all, okay if we want to think that that's way, way out in the future. In one regard, it is. But we're at a place, we're living in a place today where, in, in my opinion, we are living on the, on the lip of the edge of the end of this age. And we are living at a time where, where we are about to hear the, the, a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and he's going to call the believers out of here. Some of you have walked in here for the first time saying, what have I stepped into? He's talking about dying and, and being, you know, floating up to the sky. And now I'm just telling you, this is what the Bible says is going to happen with the church. And, and Paul was in expectation of this 2,000 years ago, and we see how far we've come or... And, and we see the condition of our society. This is not politics. I'm just saying we see the condition of this world. And we know that that time is near, considering what, what the word of God says. Incidentally, we're going to be studying Revelation in the fall. But, <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's an interesting response. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's a great book. 
uh, you know, it's the only book that says, read me, I'm special, you know, and, and, and says, you know, you get a, you get a reward for, for, for studying the book. So if you haven't studied it yet, start. Um, but that's where we're living. We're living in the last days. We really are. And he's saying that these problems that we face, and we all have them, and believe me, I'm not trying to, by the things I say, I, I hope you understand. Those of you who know me, I, I, I trust that you understand. Those of you who don't, just try to trust me when I say this. I'm not minimizing by what I'm saying the difficulty you're experiencing in your life right now. That's not what my intention is. Because life is hard. And, 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 and we experience it. We see very difficult things that happen. Death does happen at times we don't expect. And disease happens. We never would have expected it. Failures of all sorts happen just to our personal lives, let alone to, to the society as a whole. But he's saying that these problems are temporary. But these souls, these lives are eternal. And, and, and the glory that awaits us in Christ, when we're face to face with him, is beyond understanding. These problems, these afflictions, they're light, he says. They don't feel that way. But compared to the weight of glory, that's the point. That's the point. That's where the comparison comes in. We look at the things that are seen, but they're temporary. The things that we do not see, those are the things which, which are eternal. You know, and I, if I was ever to have a tattoo, and if it were possible, at least on my soul, to have a tattoo that says, the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Remember that. Keep the focus on the horizon. So often the horizon for us is, is too short. It's too close to us. You know, we read later on in, in Hebrews chapter 11, Many things, but we're told there one passage that has always just captured my attention. Speaking of Abraham and, and Sarah, that Abraham was, was willing and content to live in a tent. He was willing to be a pilgrim passing through this world. Even though he was not going to possess what God was promising, he wasn't going to possess it then. It would come later but that he was willing to live in tent, uh, tents as a pilgrim because he was looking forward to the city which is to come, who's a city with foundations, whose builder and whose maker is God. Not whose builder and maker is man. Not whose builder and maker is Abraham. Not whose builder and maker is me, but whose builder and maker is God, and it's permanent. And there's not one thing in this world that we, can, that we can hang on to right now that we can trust is permanent except the love of Jesus Christ. The love of God expressed through Jesus Christ. That salvation is permanent. And what he's promised for us, and, and go ahead, read ahead in, in Revelation, especially in 21 and 20, we read about the, the city to come with foundations. Incredible what God has for us. And it's right around the corner. But for now, there is but a moment. There is but a step between us and our passing out of this world. Our passing out of this world will happen one of two ways. You know, it's all we said that, you know, the death rate in Bucks County is one apiece. And, 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 I, and I verified it. I keep reading and everything I read confirms that. And, but for the believer, there's a slight difference. It's going to be by death or by rapture that we're leaving planet Earth. One way or the other, we're leaving planet Earth. So we need to be careful that we don't grip too tightly to the things that we see, but rather look ahead to the things that we can see, because those are the things that are eternal. You know, James will say, what is your life? It's a vapor. It's here now. And it's gone. It's like the, the, you know, the, the steam that comes off a boiling pot. You see it? It's gone. 
And, and I know, I, I say this a lot, I, I, or at least I say it to myself a lot, so I, sometimes I think, ah, I find something else to say. But Psalm, Psalm 90, verse 12, Moses writes it, but he says something powerful there, so powerful. Lord, it's a prayer. He says, teach us to number our days aright, correctly is the idea, so that we might gain a heart of wisdom. He's not saying, figure out how long you've lived and glory in that. Yeah. And we do that so often. You know, we talk about how many years a person has lived. He's not saying teach us to figure out how many days we've been here. And, and, and how can anybody figure out how many days we have left? No one can. We don't know. Because there's but a step between us and death. So what he's saying is value the moment that we're in. Not just value the moment, of course value the moment with those we love. Of course value the moment with our friends and our, and our families. That's wonderful. We have to do that. It's that. And that gives us so much pleasure. It's right. But value, count it correctly, who we are in Jesus Christ. Look, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you can't do that. You can't do that. And what's ahead of you is something you don't want to face and you can't afford to face. You can't pay the price, but you will forever because you don't have it in your back pocket to pay for it. Jesus Christ already took that price. He paid that price for yourself. He took the penalty that you deserve, that I deserve. And the beauty of, 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 of becoming a Christian, of, of knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and King and Lord, is that we don't join a church, we don't write a check, we just accept the truth that Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins and believe he paid for my sins. And then, and to, and then to lean on that, is that's the idea, to, that's faith, to lean on that, to believe that because I believe that, I'm born again and I'm, and I'm going to see him face to face one day and it, without fear, but rather with great joy. And we, we, we bum ourselves out so much. I'm not worth it. I'm not worth it. What can I do? You know what? Inflation has made us more valuable than, than we used to think. Um, nowadays, you say, what's the value of one of these vessels? Well, the value of one of these vessels, I guess that depends on how much mass <laughs> you have. Um, but the value is, give or take, about 30 bucks in terms of what you could get from the, the chemical value of, of our bodies. It's not much, but if you're satisfied with that as net worth, that's okay. Say, so, but yeah, but nowadays, you know, with, with what we know about DNA and hormones and things like that, what's the value in terms of, uh, you know, the exquisite chemistry, what, what you can do with one of these vessels? You're right. It really ramps it up fast. It's almost $7 million. Think about that. That's what you're worth, that ball of mud that you're sitting in right now. $7 million. I don't know how you cash in on it. You can't, and don't get any ideas about your husbands or anything, okay? I'm just, I'm just saying, you, you know, how do you do that? You can't. No, the value is the glory that awaits us when, when we shed these vessels and we stand before him face to face. There's the value. It's what he's done for us. Our value is based on the price that's been paid for us. And I believe it's time to reevaluate the portfolio, so to speak. And they say, so what am I doing with this body? What am I doing with, more importantly, the moment that I have here? What am I doing with this step between me and death? What am I doing here? Because one day, and that's what he says down in chapter 5, beginning around verse 9, he says, For we must all, he's speaking of believers, appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the way that we've lived these lives as Christians. We've all heard it said before, you know, you walk through a cemetery and you see two dates and a dash in the middle. That's exactly what David is saying. There is but a step, there is but a dash, there is but a moment, there is but an hour, there is but a year, there is but 15 years, but it's between me and death. And you know what? For some people, 15 years sounds like a long time. If you're 15 years old, that's that's a whole nother life. 
You ask somebody who's 85 years old. You look back on your life, 85 years, it's a long time. What did it feel like? And he or she's going to say, like that. So if you're half that age, that's half of that. Okay? We don't have much time. How do we live is the question. Here's how we live. As believers, by saying, Lord, I am yours. Rekindle in me the love that I once had for you. Stoke the fire of desire to read your word, to worship you, to pray, to, to be in fellowship with other believers. Rekindle all of that. I want to I wanna know you better than I've ever known you before. And, and not just to sit and do that, but to be used by you because I believe based upon your word, Lord, you're telling me that there are rewards ahead for the way that I've lived in this body. Not because of the things I chose to do, but the way I obeyed you. The way I yielded to your spirit. So fill me with your Holy Spirit. Because I can't do any of this in the flesh. I, only what I do by the power of God's spirit. That's the only stuff that's of value. For any one of us in this room. There's but a moment, a step, a dash. Between where all of us are in this room right now and are being called out of here by death or by rapture. It's how we use that dash, the time in that dash right now. And since we don't know how long that is, then now is the time to get started. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and for, for these things, Lord. It's amazing how you show us these things, Lord, from what so often... Sad to say, Lord, we, we call dusty, old, ancient writings to realize that they're authored by you and that you're speaking to us 3,000 years after it's written, Lord. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the way that your, your word is living, Lord, alive. It's powerful than a, sh than a double-edged sword, Lord. You know our hearts. You know where we are. You know what we need, Lord. We ask that you would Truly, Lord, that you would fill us afresh with your spirit and all the, all the busyness of our lives. And, we, and, and some of that we just can't help, Lord, in the, in the busyness and the nuttiness of our lives, Lord. Fill us afresh with your spirit, Lord. Refresh us that we would walk with you, be used by you, by your power, Lord. And that one day when we see you face to face, nothing to be ashamed of, Lord. And to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.